Hello and welcome to the Pro Yaku Report, Volume 1, Episode 11, Velocity Tracking 3. This week we're going to divide up Makun's pitches by type and evoke a little bit of animation magic using the D3 JavaScript library. This builds off of what we had done in the previous parts, parts 1 and 2, of the Velocity Tracking series. So, let those act as an introduction, and let's get started. The first thing we're going to do is go to our project and copy the VT2 project to VT3. Okay, that was easy enough. Next, we go into the VT3 project directory and we start our simple HTTP uh, server. B server on port 8888. Put it in the background. And now, if we go to localhost 8888 velocity tracker.html, we get the same old graph that we had last week. All that's fine and good, but the very first thing we need to do, just like we did last week, download the latest version of the http colon slash slash www.japanesebaseball.com slash data slash Tanaka Masahiro Velos dot CSV file. Okay, now we've downloaded it, and as you may recall from last week, it attached a dot one to the end of the file. The reason being, because there was already a Tanaka Masahiro Velos CSV file in that directory. So if we head the two Tanaka files. What we see is last week's header being batter, the pitch number, speed, and inning. And this week we have added type to the list of um, columns in the CSV file. So we're going to want to use this new number one version. So let's move one version to cover up the one or the CSV file. And if we take a directory listing, we see that we just have uh, the Velo's CSV file. And if we head it, we see that we have type, straight, shoot, slider, etc. Okay, we've got the file downloaded. Now let's reload the velocity tracker.html. It's still the same. All righty. Now, the first thing I want to do is put a title on this page. I'm really getting tired of having this uh, just be a graph without anything around it. So we take our velocity tracker.html file, open it up in a text editor, go down to the very bottom where the HTML is, and let's add a three header of Masahiro Tanaka's Velocity Tracker. Okay, and then the other thing I'm going to do this week is I'm because I'm going to be able to have different pitches be displayed, I want to be able to, number one, display what those pitches are, and number two, be able to change them. So first I'm going to create a div for this control area. Call it control. And in the control, we have the first div with ID of type. Okay, this is where I'm going to display the pitch type. 
Next, I have a button, which doesn't do anything yet. Just call it switch. Close the div tag. And then, because we've added this in the body, and we have been using the body for putting the entire chart, let's create another div with the ID velocity chart to put the chart in. Okay. Now, because we have changed where we are putting the body, we need to go up to where the body was specified or selected and say sharp velocity chart. Okay, the sharp here, just as in any CSS selector, means an ID identifier. So this will select the velocity chart, well, the tag with the ID velocity chart. If you use a period, it's for finding classes. Um, this is the same way that jQuery works, jQuery query being a very popular JavaScript library. And, of course, CSS definitions are also done this way. So now let's save our file and reload. Hey, there we go. Look at there. We've got a title and we have a button. The uh, button doesn't do anything, but that's okay. Um, but, you know, I think I kind of want this switch over on the right. And I'd really like a border around the graph. So... Let's go down to the end of the script and add a little bit of CSS. Uh, style type equal text uh, CSS slash style. And inside the CSS we have mm, velocity chart. And I'd like to make a border around it. One pixel, maybe light gray, uh, solid, and for the control panel, I want this to be positioned, fixed, from the top down one line, basically, and from the right, oh, how about uh, three M's? And want to clear the margins, clear the padding, and make this a width of about, oh, let's say 125 pixels. Okay, let's save that. Reload. Hey, we've got a nice border around the graph now. The switch is now off to the right. Title is upper left. Um, this is a little bit too close inside the chart border. So let's add a uh, padding to the top of 1M. Just bring it down one line. And I think I'd also like a little bit more space separating it from above. So let's say margin top. Oh, maybe two lines worth. So 2M. Save that. Reload. And everything's spaced out a little bit nicer. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Now the next thing we want to do is start some programming. So in order to manipulate the data, that is to change the data when we click on a button, I'm going to need to take the data variable out from inside of the data processing 
section and make it global. Var data equals, we still have it be an array, but this time what we're going to do is have it be an array of innings and speed to the pitch type. So the very first index that I'm going to want in data is going to be pitch type. So we're going to need a few more variables here to control it. So let's have the pitch types is going to be an array. Um, the type index is going to be an integer starting from zero. And we're going to have the current type, um, or actually the current data set, uh, be null at the beginning. We'll initialize that sh shortly. So next, we read in the inning, we read in the speed, and we also need to read in the type. So x.type, as you recall from our CSV file. CSV file right there, type. Um, I'm going to take the data setting part away here. Uh, this too may go. And I'm going to manage the data a little bit differently. So the first thing after loading in the inning speed and type is going to be checking to see if data sub t does not exist, then we're going to need to initialize data sub t to an empty array. Next, and this is similar to what we had before, but instead of putting it into a separate variable, we say data sub t sub inning does not exist. Then we say data subtype sub inning equals an array with the speed initialized. Otherwise, else, data sub type sub inning dot push the speed onto the end of the queue. So we add the speed to the array, data of type of inning. The rest of the data is all fine as is, but we still need to set a couple of variables. Uh, for example, our very first new global variable types, we can use the D3 um, array functionality where it gets the keys from a from the hash table and it takes those from data. So what this does is this takes the first dimensional keys, that is the types, and outputs them in an array that we're calling types. Next, we want to set what the current data set is. So the current data set will be data sub types sub type index, which is initialized to zero up above. And finally, we want to put the current type name into our control panel up here above switch. So to do that, we use the D3 select function to get the oops, sharp type. And we add the HTML. Uh, let's make it bold. Plus types sub type index plus slash bold and now we should get the current type index 
at the current index, which will be 0. And finally, um, data. Before, when we initialized the chart, we were using the variable data, which was a two-dimensional array. Now we've got three dimensions in the array, so we want to use our current two-dimensional data set for initializing the velocities being displayed. And I think that'll do it. Let's save this, reload, and see what we get. Whoa! How about that? Um, this is straight, which in English would really be fastball. So everything is concentrated at the top of the chart. There is this one anomaly down here, which was called straight. And you know, I think that that may be a mistake in the data. Um, and that's one of the really good things about visualizing your data is that anomalies like this will really start to stick out. So data may need a little bit of correction here. Otherwise, he's uh, Tanaka. Uh, he did f slow down a bit there in the ninth inning. As you may recall, the chart previously, it looked like in the ninth inning he was still going very strong, but this does show a slight decrease in the minimum speed of his fastball as the game progresses. Of course, he's also got the maximum speed fastball, um, which isn't an outlier in the ninth inning, so um, with a regular distribution of fastball data. So this is looking pretty nice. Now, of course, switch doesn't do anything yet. So let's fix that. Now, what do we want such a function to do? Uh, function uh, toggle type. Uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to increase the type index. Type index plus one. And then we want it to rotate around all types. So we say types.length. Um, well, modular division by um, types.length. So no matter how high our index gets, we go, we're going to just keep going round and round all of the different types. Um, we want to set the current data set to data subtypes subtype index. Okay, this is the new index, so whatever follows straight will come up next. And then we want to display this in our type div um, right here in the HTML. So we say d3 select quote sharp uh, type. Okay, so now we've selected our div and we want to stick in the HTML um, bold plus type subtype index. This, of course, coming from or the same thing that we had done above in the bold. And then finally, here's where the magic happens. d3.select all. Um, now this time we want svg to g. Now what does this select? If we look at our um, inspector, what we're getting is each of these SVG blocks, we are getting the uh, chart, um, which is grouped under G. 
So what we what we want to do is we want to transform this G into a different box. So this is what we're getting. So we select all of those and we apply data current and we call chart dot duration with a 1000 millisecond delay. Now what this is going to do is redraw the chart from its current boxes to the boxes that represent the current data. So we're going from straight to something and the data is going to be transformed over 1000 milliseconds or the course of one second. And of course to make this happen we're going to need to call that when we hit on click the button. So we say on click JavaScript uh, toggle type unquote let's save that reload and hit switch whoa that was neat okay his shoot are just a slight bit lower speed sliders ooh it drops down quite a bit more fork ball ah fork ball speeds rise a little bit uh change up drops back down and did you notice the tenth inning didn't move that's probably because he didn't throw a change up in the tenth inning so we switch again and we have curve balls this is going f down farther along the scale of speed pitches and again tenth inning no curve balls switch again and we have his cutter okay and this time the ninth inning didn't change so he has not thrown a cut ball in the ninth or tenth inning over the past four seasons and we click again and sinker that changed but nothing else changed what's going on here well if you have a look at the data what's going on here is that in the sixth inning he only threw one sinker over the past four years so that one sinker was at clocked at 86 miles per hour um, as you may recall we converted all of these to miles per hour last year or last time and none of the other data changed so this may be a little problem with our program that it's still displaying something when there is no data to be displayed click again and we're back up to straight so we looped all the way around to straight and I think it's just neat watching the animation of, of these graphs go up and down um, but uh, you know as I said we've got a problem when data is not there also it sure would be nice to know how many pitches were thrown in each instance um, right now we don't really know what the sample size is we can kinda tell that this that the change up um, and especially the cutter and sinker are all with a great deal less data than say straight and with that I'm going to wrap up the D3 JavaScript tutorial section of this week's podcast and now it's time for the pocket calendar the WBC is going on in Tokyo Dome with the two winners moving on to the US rounds Japan of course hoping to be in there if you're interested in what has gone on taken place the past couple of rounds please tune in to the Japan Baseball Weekly Podcast, which will be coming out tomorrow, Monday. 
Um, also in the podcast, Jim interviews former Yakult and Nocton hurler Kevin Hodges, who is now scouting for the Cebu Lions. Um, the from what I've heard, the interview went well over an hour, and John, through some miracle, managed to trim it down to a reasonable size. Also happening right now is OpenSin. OpenSin is basically Japanese English for uh, preseason games. Currently, in the standings, Hiroshima is on top, six wins and a loss. With Hanshin in second, five wins, a loss, and a tie. SoftBank takes a third, uh, five wins, two losses, and a tie. And the Giants are in fourth place, three and two, with two ties. And the Giants, just like the WBC team, which is comprised of a lot of Giants, seem to be having a hard time scoring runs. So it's not just the WBC Giants who are lacking run support. Everybody else is 500 or below, with Oryx taking up the rear, winning their first game in seven tries on Saturday. And with that, I submit to you this week's Proyaki Report. Thank you for joining me. Take care. <laughs>